Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and tonight is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD. Um, as you know, this is a webinar where we're going to talk about Lyme disease. I am very interested, as usual, to see what you have in store with me tonight with your questions. For those of you that are coming back again, I'm, I'm glad to see you. Um, I uh, at least see your names on my message board, and uh, I think that means you're probably getting some value out of this. So I'm glad um, that I keep giving you something that helps you. For those of you that are new, I'm glad to see you here as well too. The way that people participate in these webinars or the way you can participate in these webinars, there's two ways. Number one, you can write a question to me. You can be very bold, especially on your first time and write a question. The way you do that is in the chat box at the bottom. Um, you can write your question to me as a regular chat. There's also an ability to do it as a question, but Either way, I, I will see it, okay? I prefer if you just do it as the regular chat and not as the, the question mark that's there. And then um, as you write your question, I ask that you uh, type out the whole question before you click enter and try to send it to me. If you try to use the enter key to create paragraphs, what that does is just sends a separate question to me, which really gets difficult on my side. The other thing I ask is that we keep these as shorter questions. Uh, this format does not work out well for um, very long or complex questions, okay? Um, I am, as usual, creating a recording of tonight's webinar. So if you happen to miss something, you'll be able to hear it again. Um, I will send you out an email tomorrow morning with a synopsis of what we talked about, as well as a link uh, to where you can see that recording. If you happen to miss that recording uh, or that email, just know that somewhere around 9 to 9.30 a.m. Central Standard Time, Austin, Texas time, I will send that email out you can find the recording midway down on my webinars page at, um, at Treat Lyme um, by Marty Ross MD at that treatlime.net. Okay. So there you can always find it even if you happen to miss that email. All right. And so one other thing, one other business keeping thing, we're doing three uh, uh, webinars this month. Um, so we'll be uh, today and next week. And then the following week after that, um, I'll be off and then uh, we'll do one the last week in March. So there's three that I have set aside or three days I've set aside to do webinars this month. Okay. All right. So without any further ado, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. <clears throat> All right. So this first question, this is from Maureen. Um, I should have also said, if you're participating in the live version, you will be able to see the question at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but for those that are listening to the recorded version, the, the question doesn't show up. So I'm gonna read it so that everyone that is uh, participating, at least in the recorded version, can hear these, uh, see what the questions are as well too, all right? So Maureen says, um, I'm on a Bartonella treatment plan, methylene blue, cinnamon clove, oregano capsules, cryptolepis, Japanese knotweed, and other supportive supplements such as adrenal support and multivitamins. Last few weeks, I'm having a constant debilitating fatigue, flare up, and other symptoms. You suggested it might be yeast, uh, gut yeast. I eat very little sugar, but I'm under constant stress, sometimes trauma in my life. Do you have any suggestions to help support my vagus nerve and nervous system or, or I do meditate and get counsel appreciate all you do. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> so in terms, I think you're asking is how do you, how do you de-stress when things are complicated? And, you know, stress is going to, is definitely going to add um, to your fatigue. It, it may even be a factor in getting too many yeast in your intestines as well, too. Generally, um, I, I, I like trying to have people deal with stress in a number of ways. Number one, identify what's giving you the stress. And if you can somehow um, limit that thing that's giving you the stress or the things that are giving you stress, then go ahead and do that, okay? Um, number two, if you are able to do movement, if you are able to do even light exercise, then exercise can be helpful. The difficulty with people with tick-borne infections and even Moltoxes sometimes though, is that when you exercise, sometimes it will make you worse, all right? So you have to find a level of movement that you can tolerate. For some people, that may mean just moving their arms and legs while laying on their back in bed. Other people, it could mean going out and doing aggressive walks, but you need to find what your tolerance is, all right? So the way to determine what your tolerance is is find that activity you love to do. 
go out and, and, and then test it. So start doing it by maybe doing five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. And if you don't pay the price for it the next day, then that was a tolerable level and test to find out what is the limit that you can do before you get worse the next day. By worse, I mean more pain, um, more fatigue, maybe even worsen uh, thinking functions as well too, all right? All right, number three, um, in terms of de-stressing, I do like uh, mind-body techniques like meditation can be helpful. There's another thing you could look at, and that is to get some training in some of these mindfulness techniques that have been found to be helpful in, um, in tick-borne infections, and that is to focus on ones that are helpful at regulating what's known as the limbic system in the body. And there's two main methods, or three main methods. There's something called brain tap. That's If you Google brain tap, you'll find the page on that one. There's another one called the Gupta method, and then there's another one called uh, by any hopper called uh, dynamic neuro retraining system or DNRS. OK, any of those can sometimes be helpful for a person of those. I would call the um, Gupta method probably to be the um, least aggressive, much more Buddhist mindfulness. And I would call the any hopper technique to be a little bit more. Um, regulated and a little more assertive in, in how the education happens with that too, okay? All right. And then finally, you can help how your body handles the stress. And there's a few things you can do with that. So first of all, when people are under stress, we can give them what are known as adaptogens. These are substances that help your body deal with stress, all right? And one of the more common ones that's been used for um, centuries uh, within Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine is to use something called ashwagandha. So that's a supplement, okay? And uh, usually it comes as a 400 milligram to 500 milligram pill, depending on the brand you get. And usually I'll have people take one or two in the morning and one or two between one and two in the afternoon. It appears from animal studies and it's been very, it helps both the adrenals and the thyroid glands work better. It may even help the immune system work better as well too, all right? And then in terms of herbs or supplements you can do that um, can modify your neurologic or your brain response, um, take a look at something called L-theanine. Um, theanine is a component of green tea and um, it, it gets crosses over into the, the brain and in the brain, a lot of it is converted over to something called GABA. And our brain is full of GABA receptors. In fact, GABA receptors are also known as GABA benzodiazepine receptors, which is where basically drugs like Valium and, um, and, uh, and those kind of medicines that we prescribe for anxiety, um, that is where the GABA binds, all right? So you can kind of get a similar non-addictive effect from doing that. And so a dose range on the L-theanine is a 100 milligram pill, and you want to take anywhere, you can take it up to 1,200 milligrams a day, and I would have people divide it into three different doses if you're going to, especially if you're going to be up at the higher doses, okay? So you might start at 100 milligrams three times a day, see how you tolerate it, and then you could go to 200 milligrams three times a day. You could work your way up. Realize it can sometimes be a little bit sedating, okay? All right. So those, those are some thoughts for you to look at, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Maureen. <clears throat> hello, David. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. Thank you for everything you do for us. You're welcome. I got to change glasses. <laughs> These are readers, but they're only in the bottom. There's nothing up here. So if you notice, I keep tilting back so that I can see your questions. These are readers that um, basically are the same throughout. So now I can read the question looking straight on here. All right, C. Uh, hello, Dr. Ross. Thank you for everything you do for us. You're welcome. I have two questions for you today. Uh, being ill for 20 years, one of my first symptoms is uh, urine excessive production. It was terribly high before my treatment starting in 2006 to 2012. I'd drink a glass of water and I had to empty my bladder three times within the hour. The symptom has declined since my IV antibiotic treatment from my LLMD and 08, but I still have this problem, but not as severe question. 
Um, remembering Dr. Shoemaker telling how the hormone production decreases the brain starting with MSH and working down to all hormones, including ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone. Is there any way to test for this hormone and to increase the production when it is low? Um, oh, what a relief that would be. Question two, second symptom is phlegm production in my throat causing speaking problems. Can't speak on a phone due to having to clear or cough with talking. Would I need a person to assist me if I join your Lime United? Let's see if there's another part to that. Hold on here. All right, let me um, <clears throat> let me see how I can answer that. Let's see here. Go back here. All right. So first of all, um, there is a hormone called antidiuretic hormone ADH, and it actually can be measured. And if it is low, you're going to be peeing too much. Um, your kidneys are not getting the right message to tell them to retain water. Okay. And so um, the way to evaluate if that's happening, there's a, a, a few tests you need. Number one, a blood test called ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Number two, if you are holding too much water or letting water go too easily, um, what will happen is you'll, um, your, uh, it'll change the concentration of your blood, basically. And that's something we call an osmolality. So you want to measure both um, serum osmolality and urine osmolality, all right? So your blood test would be antidiuretic hormone as well as measure um, the um, serum osmolality. And then you would also give a urine test, which is looking at urine osmolality, all right? The other thing you should that they should do as part of looking at this is just do a general blood test to see how your kidneys are working. And, and on that panel will be blood sugar, because if you have excessive blood sugar, you're going to pee out a lot more as well, too. So they should be looking for other causes as well, too. Now, if you do have an abnormal antidiuretic hormone, one thing that you can take, there's a prescription medicine called DDAVP. That's DDAVP. Um, I believe that's also known as desmopressin that is a spray you can use in your nose that will actually help you uh, retain water, okay? So there is a treatment you can do for that if you have abnormalities in your ADH and also in your osmolality too, okay? All right, all right. Second, oh, the phlegm production. So um, in terms of phlegm production, Often, excessive phlegm is going to be due to um, allergens, things we're allergic to, okay? You're going to be getting uh, drip from your sinuses down into the back of your throat, and you have to clear that, okay? Now, there's a few things you could do about that. Number one, try, I would suggest avoiding dairy. And the reason I would avoid dairy is dairy thickens your mucus and makes it a lot harder to bring up, okay? All right. Not that you're reacting to the dairy, but dairy thickens mucus, okay? All right, and that, by that I mean cow, a cow's milk dairy. So that's not gonna happen if you're doing rice milk, soy milk, all those other substitutes, but it will happen with cow's milk, all right? All right, number two, um, I would try a course of, of quercetin. So quercetin, um, that's Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N, Quercetin is a bioflavonoid um, that's in a supplement pill that is very useful at stabilizing your allergy cells so they're not making histamines as much when they're exposed to things you're allergic to, all right? And so quercetin comes as a 250 milligram pill. The product I like for that is a product made by Thorne uh, called uh, quercetin phytosome. And uh, their product, I would do it as a 250 milligram pill, take two pills, two or three times a day, okay? All right, so those are some things I would look at. Finally, sometimes that excessive phlegm can be because you got sinus infections, all right? And so you might wanna look at dripping backwards, that is, and so you might wanna see if your primary care doctor can help you figure out whether you actually have an infection up in your sinuses that's dripping back down and you're having a hard time clearing it, okay? Now, about the Lime United, so everyone, I think mo most of you know now that I have a, um, uh, a membership group 
for people wanting support in Lyme disease. And we're currently up to about, it's growing, we're up to about 72 members now. And, um, and so we've got a very involved group of people that it's a very good group. It's a nice group. These are nice people, right? And people in the group um, give support to each other. They share ideas that they have. I even learned some things from some of the members of our group. Um, but then also there's ways of interacting with me in there too. All right. So let me just do a quick screen share. I'm going to show you what it looks like. Um, and any of you can join it. If you think you're getting a lot out of my these webinars, um, my membership support group is uh, is basically like these webinars on steroids, okay? Um, you get a lot more, all right? So let me just do a quick screen share here for you. Ah, they, uh, bear with me while I'm hesitating that my um, webinar service has changed how they do this. <laughs> it's very interesting. Okay. All right. So um, this is my um, Lime United page. Okay. And uh, this is the actual membership group. I'm going to show you how you can sign up for this in a minute too. But on Lime United, um, we have, um, you, there's a landing homepage. All right. And then in here, there's various ways that you can interact. Um, one, we have a, a page that says, say hello. And this is where I ask new members to introduce themselves so that we know who they are. And this is a good way to get started here. And uh, we all, all of us that are here, respond to that new member, welcome them in. Uh, we get to find out a little bit about them. So I encourage people to do that. There's another forum we have, which is called Member to Member. And in our member to member forum, this is where members, not me, but mem other members can ask questions of each other and get um, ideas. So for instance, one of our recent uh, texts was a person that was wanting some tape to hold his jaw closed more at nighttime so that he wasn't drying out his mouth. And everyone shared with that person the thing they found best for that, okay? All right, there's another forum called Share Your Wins on Wednesdays. And in our Share Our Wins and Wednesdays, we want to hear what's going well for people because we can all learn from it and we can all celebrate too, all right? Then there's two ways that you can interact with me. There is this Office Hours with Marty Ross, MD, which is a forum that once a, um, once a day, Monday to Friday, between 12 and 1 p.m. Austin, Texas time, I respond to any questions people have written in the last 24 hours and give you a response to questions that you may have, all right? In addition, once a week, I have um, a webinar that is held in a Zoom room called Ask Marty Ross MD, all right? Or Ask Marty Ross MD Live. And what we're doing with this form right now, it's an hour and a half. Uh, the time of day that happens is 1 p.m. Austin, Texas time. And in, the, in this forum, I basically take two people that have asked me to review their case and we review it together in a Zoom room. They ask me questions, I ask them questions, I give a response, and then our community members jump in and give ideas as well too. And we really get some good help for people this way too, all right? The last half hour of this Ask Marty Ross MD Live, I actually am uh, taking just regular questions that anyone may have, all right? And then finally, we have another forum called Unities Take Charge. And this is where uh, members can um, and can um, host their own events, okay? All right, so this is where, this is, um, I encourage each of you to take a look at this, okay? Now, in terms of, go back here. All right, so David, um, anyhow, I just wanna introduce that group. Um, you don't need a person to assist you to be part of the Lime United. I'm, you Basically, it's a very straightforward sign up process. And then, um, and the where you sign up is, um, there is a page at uh, treatlime.net. Actually, I, should, I meant to show that to you. Let me go back there real quick. All right, so at Treat Lime by Marty Ross MD, um, you would go to the Lime United page. And this is where I explain what the group is. And you can click on this join now page. Um, all right, and at this point, we're offering uh, 30 days free membership 
And then after 30 days, you do have to pay. I want to let everyone know I'm toying with the idea of cutting that down to seven days here very soon. So um, this would be the time to sign up if you want to have a longer period of having free membership. All right. All right. All right. So, David, I hope I answered your questions there. Um, if you do need assistance signing up um, on our, um, you could reach out to me or, and I would have you be in contact with my receptionist who could help you with that. Okay. All right. Good luck to you. Hello, Locke. Let's see, is doxycycline an antibiotic that might be of use in sinus infections or are other antibiotics more effective? Um, so for sinus infections, I usually would not use a tetracycline. It might help to a degree, but it's not the most effective. Uh, ones that can be very effective for sinus infections would be something called Augmentin, um, which is a penicillin. Sometimes uh, something called cefuroxime, which is in a family called the cephalosporins, and then also uh, clarithromycin, which is also known as biaxin, and then finally a sulfa antibiotic called Bactrim. Those would be kind of the main go-tos that most of us might use for bacterial sinus infections, okay? Now that clarithromycin also could be very useful at helping with Lyme and Bartonella, for instance, okay? All right. <clears throat> Good luck to you. Thanks for that question. Hello, Francis. Let's see. Thank you, Dr. Marty, for all you do for us. You're welcome. Let's see. I've been curious for a while about this and wonder what your thoughts are on the following. I've been battling Bartonella uh, and secondary Lyme a while, and recently I had uh, RSV. Weirdly enough, my BART symptoms, including anxiety, headaches, insomnia, et cetera, went down greatly. Now that I'm well from the RSV, the BART symptoms have once come roaring back. I've noticed this happens before when I'm cycling through a virus. Have you seen this in your patients and can comment on it? And is this form of what is called quorum sensing, the idea that bacteria viruses somehow communicate um, Oh, and is this a form of what is known as quorum sensing, the idea that bacteria and viruses somehow communicate with each other? Thank you. So, Francis, I, you may have asked this in a previous webinar or somebody else wrote about this, too, because I remember answering this before, maybe maybe two or three weeks ago. Um, I don't know. I don't know why that's happening to you. Um, I don't know if it is part of what is known as quorum sensing because I'm not clear why that has happened. I haven't seen that happen before with anyone else in my practice, to be honest with you, okay? So I get stumped every now and then. I'm sorry you stumped me on this one. All right. Good luck to you, Francis. <clears throat> Hello, Doug. I see, hi, Dr. Ross. A few questions. Once I've taken the VCS test, which I failed, do you recommend retesting to see if the results are different? If so, what is the test telling me on a second go around? I think you once said it could be indicative of Lyme or mold toxicity, but not sure. Two, your discussion of excess cytokines seems to be based on symptoms we feel after die off from antimicrobials, which causes immune system manufacture more cytokines. But what about the symptoms before treatment has started, which can be very severe? Uh, what are they caused by? And three, I believe I heard you say recently that you found in your practice that DMSA treatment for mercury toxicity was not effective. Can you elaborate or correct me? If it wasn't effective, how do you treat those who had mercury toxicity? Okay. All right. Great questions. All right. So number one, the VCS, which stands for Visual Contrast Study, is a test you could do on your computer online. Um, and it you're basically trying to distinguish between various shade um, objects that have various shades of white, black, and gray. And if you have had biotoxin exposures and they're still in you, um, you can have abnormal VCS, all right? Now, not everyone that has mold toxicity fails a VCS test, all right? So it's not, it's not diagnostic if it's negative, it doesn't mean you, it doesn't prove you don't have mold toxins, all right? 
But if you are a person that does fail the VCS test, a possible cause is mold toxicity. And generally, as we get those mold toxins out, you will have normal VCS testing in the future. Okay. All right. All right. Secondly, so my discussion of cytokines is that excess cytokines give you symptoms. All right. And um, out when you, and so those symptoms that too many cytokines give you even before a Herxheimer reaction are a difficulty thinking, insomnia, hurting all over, hormonal uh, dysfunction, et cetera, okay? All those symptoms we call Lyme symptoms and all of those symptoms we call mold toxicity symptoms, the majority of those symptoms are because your immune system is making too many of these inflammatory chemicals called cytokines, all right? Now, if you start killing a germ, the immune system sees those dead germ parts and makes more cytokines, making your underlying Lyme symptoms or your underlying mold toxicity symptoms or your underlying intestinal yeast overgrowth symptoms, making them worse, okay? All right, so basically cytokines cause the same symptoms. It's just that in a Herx, the quality, the intensity is worse because you're dumping even more cytokines in on a system that's already swimming in too many cytokines, okay? All right, number three. So DMSA is an agent you can take to bind uh, mercury and even lead, okay? My comment, I should have been a little bit clear about my comment. DMSA is effective at removing lead and mercury. My comment was though, is that I have never found a person get overall benefit in terms of feeling better or getting over their tick-borne infections by removing heavy metals. I just haven't seen it. So the only time in my practice I would actually even uh, look for heavy metal toxicity and even consider treating it is if I was about maybe a year or more into a person's treatment and they weren't getting better, then I might look to see if they have heavy metal toxicity, but I would only treat it if it was just astronomically high levels. Minor elevations of lead and mercury, removing them, although you can get the level down, did not result in a person improving unless they had excessive amounts, okay? All right. Thanks for your question, Doug. Good luck to you. Hello, D Brown. Hi, is it working? I hope it is. <laughs> I think you probably, uh, I hadn't quite logged on yet when you wrote that. Hello, Ken. Let's see. Marty, I would appreciate if you could recommend the best programs Igenix have to test one blood for Lyme and Bartonella. I have finally found out how I can currently send blood to Igenix from Ontario. Yeah. So <clears throat> the main screening test I like using these days, Ken, is Igenix has a test method, which is called an immunoblot. And they have an immunoblot test method for Borrelia, which is Lyme, and they have an immunoblot test method for Bartonella. And essentially what the immunoblot is doing is it's measuring if your immune systems are making antibodies against uh, those infections. And the technique that they use to do this is about 95% sensitive, meaning if you have Bartonella or you have um, a Borrelia in you, these tests will be positive 95% of the time, all right? That's where I would start, okay? Now, when you do the immunoblot, you want it, it's measuring antibodies from two different families, one family called IgM, one called IgG. So you wanna make sure that you check off the box that is for IgM and the second box for IgG for Borrelia, for instance, and one box for IgM and one for IgG for um, Bartonella as well too, all right? Now, why why is this test so good? Um, so what they're doing, what Igenix is doing with their immunoblot is they're looking to see if you have antibodies against a large variety of strains. So for instance, on their Borrelia Lyme test, they're looking to see if you're making antibodies against eight strains of Lyme. By comparison, the LabCorp and Quest and Canadian version of looking at for Lyme antibodies is called a Western blot. That's only looking to see if you have antibodies against the original East Coast strain of Lyme 
uh, from back in the 70s, okay? And we have many more versions of Lyme that impact people. So one of the reasons that our test is it looks to see if we have antibodies against more strains, all right? On the Bartonella side, we recognize that there are 15 strains of Bartonella that can give people Bartonella infection and cause problems. And um, the way that the Igenix method works is they can report if you have antibodies against four of those 15 strains. But in addition, their test looks to see if you have antibodies against any germ within the family. We call that a genus test, okay? So if your genus test is positive, but your four specific strains are negative, it means you have one of the other 11 strains, basically, all right? That's why I recommend their test. The other thing that they do is they, uh, when they're as part of performing this test, they basically grow these Lyme and Bartonella proteins that they want to use in the laboratory. Um, so these are genetically produced, genetically modified uh, proteins. And what they've done is they removed sequences in these proteins that would wrongly attract um, antibodies made against various virus infections. So they've made it so that there's less chance of getting a false positive test, okay? All right, so that's why, that's why it's best. You're gonna pay to get both your Lyme and the Bartonella panels done. You're gonna pay um, $900 US, all right? So it's not cheap, but it is the, the, the best upfront test you can do for looking at Bartonella and Borrelia, okay? All right, good luck to you, Ken. <clears throat> Let me just do a quick screen share. For those of you that are wanting more information about what I'm talking about here, take a look at, so take a look at my Treat Line by Marty Russ MD site, okay? And then in terms of, I have written an article about what is the best test and I review other options so you know why I'm calling it the best test. But to find that article, take a look at my test section here. And in here, I talk about the best lab and test for Borrelia, Bartonella and Babesia. In here, I also review why the immunoblot is better than the Armin Ellispot and Infecto Lab Ellispots, which would be your other alternative. So I explain that as well too. I also talk about why I don't like vibrant labs and DNA connections. All right. So you could, uh, <coughs> if you want more information, take a look at this article here. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Ken. Laura says, hello, Dr. Ross. Hello, Laura. Let's see something here. Hello, Sandra. Let's see, what tick-borne infections, Lyme, BART, et cetera, causes low white blood cells and platelets? What, why does this happen? What about mold? Thanks so much. So um, any of the tick-borne infections, meaning Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia can suppress your white blood cells and even the platelets, okay? Um, they release chemicals that suppress the bone marrow in some situations. Um, I'm not quite sure if I've seen that happen in mold toxicity before. Uh, so on that count, I would say, I don't think that that would lower your, your blood counts. It's usually the infections that will do that. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Sandra. Hello, Jason. Let's see, I've been battling Lyme, Bartonella, and possibly Babesia for four years. It has been debilitating, and every time I stop treatment, I relapse. I've tried some of your protocols, which help, but again, it doesn't last. I have been to a bunch of doctors, and none of them have a clue. Two are LMDs, even. Any suggestions for a good doc in the Pittsburgh area? Hmm. You know, I don't know who is in the Pittsburgh area, unfortunately. Um, on the other side of your state would be Ann Corson um, in the Philadelphia area. I believe she's down in the center city now. 
she would probably be the best person I'm aware of out there. But beyond that, I don't know. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Um, and I, whoever you get should be able to help you find a plan. The one thing I would tell you is when I've got a person that's a frequent relapser, let's say that they get all better on any protocol, they get well, and then they stop treatment and they, they get into relapse pretty quickly. What I will do in situations like that is when I get a person well, I will wind up leaving them on lower doses of either herbal antibiotics or prescription antibiotics to do germ control. So for instance, if I had been using Otoba bark and cat's claw for their Lyme, and I had been using Houtonia and Sida Acuda for their Bartonella, and then for biofilms and for persister cells, I had been using cinnamon, clove, oregano oil capsules, what I would likely do, and I have been using all of the drops at 30 drops twice a day, and those capsules, the cinnamon clove oregano I've been using is one capsule twice a day. When I go into relapse prevention, I might go ahead and scale back to just using cat's claw and the hutania, each as 15 drops twice a day. And I might continue one capsule of the cinnamon clove oregano uh, one time a day, okay? So you're just kind of using enough to suppress uh, any germs that might start coming up. The other thing I like to do in my frequent relapsers is to be very strong about doing gut repair with probiotics. The reason is your uh, bacteria in your gut, the healthy bacteria send signals that help your immune system work better, all right? So I like using, um, spore forming probiotics to do that. And um, the and the product I like using for that is something called a core biotic by Research Nutritionals, a couple pills twice a day. I would keep that going definitely even when you're um, in your, uh, when you're done treating with the full course of the antibiotics, okay? And then finally, I would look at using something called transfer factors. So transfer factors are, um, chemicals that are made by white blood cells that detect the detective white blood cells, the white blood cells that find an infection, make these uh, chemicals called transfer factors that basically tell the rest of the immune system there's an infection. And those transfer factors also attach to the infection. And it's a way of charging the immune system to go after just those infections, okay? And so there is a product that is made by uh, research nutritionals, which is called Transfer Factor L Plus. And that Transfer Factor L Plus has in it the transfer factors that are made against the variety of tick-borne infections, as well as, uh, I believe, chlamydia pneumonia, human herpes virus type 6, I believe, is in there, and even cytomegalovirus. But I would have a person do that as one pill twice a day. Okay, all right. Let me do a quick screenshot. I want to show you a few things to take a look at. Okay, so this is my supplement store. Earlier tonight, I had mentioned a quercetin product. I'll just show you where you can find that here. All right, so the product I recommend for quercetin is this quercetin phytosome um, by Thorn? Okay, all right. And then in terms of the transfer factors, you can find those. You can either write transfer factor up here in the search bar, or they are a product by Research Nutritionals. And I got me down here. So this is the transfer factor plasmic that I was telling you about right here, okay? And this would be uh, one pill twice a day as well too, all right? And then um, in terms of, if you look in my, um, over here in my, um, Lyme, my online Lyme guide, um, there is, I think I have a section here on relapse prevention where, oh, right here. All right. So here I have an article. It's, it's a little bit maybe older article, 
where I talk about steps to help prevent uh, relapse. And so, for instance, I talk about using uh, herbal antibiotics at lower doses, okay? And I also talk in here about other steps to support the immune system. That includes doing sleep, exercise, keep up your detoxification, um, doing immune support with a transfer factor, um, L plus that I was, oh, I'm sorry, L plus. I should do plasmic earlier, but L plus, okay. And um, I should put in here probiotics. I need to update that, but you can read through this article as well too, okay? All right, and... I think that takes care of it there. Oh, one last thing. Um, when it comes to, let me get back here. So regarding my supplement store, that those are products I used with my practice in Seattle. And um, at this point, as you know, I'm not clinically practicing anymore, but I maintain the store because um, the products are great. And if you're looking for sources, take a look at what I've got there. If you're looking for products that I trust, you can see what I've curated for you Anyone can buy from my store, anyone, doesn't matter where you are. And then, um, and the advantages from buying from me is that I, um, I I sell my products at the lowest prices the manufacturers allow, okay? I can't go any lower. If they do, I'll, they'll pull the products from me. Number two, if you have any taxes you might owe, I pay for those. And number three, if you order, uh, if your order is over $50, I will pay for your shipping if you're in the U.S., that is, okay? All right, so those are reasons to consider um, buying from me as well, too, okay? All right, good luck to you, Jason. Hello, Joyce. Hi, Dr. Ross. Tuesday was my first Lime United, and I wanted to say thank you. Wow. <laughs> Great, Joyce. I feel like I, you're here uh, to plug my group for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad for you. Let's see. I only got to participate less than the last 45 minutes, but I learned so much in such a short period of time. I encourage everyone to participate if their schedule allows. It is the, it is the same time every Tuesday. Or does it vary every week? Thank you. So Joyce, wow. <laughs> Everyone, I did not pay Joyce to do that, but thank you for doing that, Joyce. I appreciate you. Um, uh, I appreciate your plugging the group. I, I do think it's a great group and I'm glad you got something out of it. So the Lime United, the Ask Marty Ross MD Live that you're talking about is um, each Tuesday. I don't even skip weeks on it. It's Tuesday between uh, one and 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, which is Austin, Texas time, okay? We have people that participate from around the world. I've got somebody from Dubai. I've got people in Australia. I've got people in the UK. I've got people in Ireland. We've got people up in, um, in Canada. It's a very global group of people and a very nice group of people as well. It's a nice, it's a nice support group. It's a little bit different than Facebook. <laughs> And then um, the other, again, the other thing, um, Joyce, as you know, that I mentioned earlier tonight is that the other way to interact with me is Monday to Friday. Um, you can write questions to me and I will respond to them through a forum there that I call um, Office Hours with Marty Ross MD. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm glad you got something out of it. Good. Hello, Laura. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. Two questions. One, how long does someone need to be out of a moldy environment before noticing any positive health improvements, assuming they're on binders and no moldy items are with them? Two, I'm treating BART and mold slowly, but I now have a sinus infection, mucus, and cough that won't go away with over-the-counter herbal treatments. Which antibiotics is best to treat sinus infections with somebody treating BART and mold. Thank you for your guidance. All right. So, you know, if it is, so be aware, I mean, you could be having um, an allergic sinusitis as well too, but if this is a bacterial sinusitis, you might consider using a clarithromycin, 500 milligrams twice a day, which clarithromycin can be a part of a Bartonella treatment as well too. Okay. All right. And it'd be okay to use even as you're treating uh, mold toxicity as well too. And then, um, and the way you would use it for a sinus infection is 500 milligrams twice a day for two to three weeks, all right? And um, 
it, it depends on what other part you what else you are using in your Bartonella treatment. You may be able just to add it on top. If you are using azithromycin as part of your Bartonella treatment, you would want to stop the azithromycin while you're using the clarithromycin. They're in the same family. You don't need to be on two drugs from the same family. The clarithromycin is much better at getting rid of sinus infections than the azithromycin is. Okay. All right. All right. And then in terms of how long does it take to respond to treatment for mold toxicity when you're out of mold exposure? It can be anywhere from three to four months up to a year, but usually by three to four months, maybe six months in, you should start feeling better or be better. Okay. Um, so just keep that in mind. Now, if what I usually do is I'll start my patients on their binders and then at about four months to six months, I'm going to want to go back and repeat um, my uh, urine mold toxin test to see if we're making any headway, right? Now, you have to be careful about how you interpret those tests, all right? So sometimes what you'll find on a first time that you go back and recheck, the test looks worse, but the person actually is doing better, all right? And what happens, the reason that that can happen is you're, although the majority of your mold toxins are excreted into the bile system, some of them get urinated out. And to have them urinated out, the uh, urination system, the, the urine detox system has to be working well too, all right? Sometimes when you are loaded with mold toxins, the capacity, the ability of the kidneys to release the mold toxins and pee them out is impaired too. So as you start recovering, sometimes you'll be able to pee out more and that initial test will look worse, all right? But if I've got a person that's not feeling better and then I go back in and test and their, their levels are not budging or they're higher, then I still have to wonder, are you still being exposed even though you think you're in a mold-free environment? Or it's also possible that some people become colonized with mold spores from having been in a moldy environment and then um, they, the mold spores that are living in their sinus passages, not necessarily giving you a sinusitis, but living there in small amounts or in your intestinal tract become producers of those mold toxins, okay? So if I'm very sure, pretty sure, you know, somebody's had a home inspection done, I'm pretty clear that they're out of mold toxins and we go back in four to six months, they're not feeling much better and their mold toxin profile is not changing much then I might, in addition to using binders, I might start adding in anti-fungals um, to kill the mold, uh, the mold spores, okay? And so uh, for, your, for the intestinal tract, I would use something called itraconazole, and that also can leak back through into the nose and treat what's up in your sinuses. And at times, I would also use a um, sinus nose spray of either nystatin or amphotericin or even itraconazole to clear what's up here in the sinuses as well too. Okay, all right. Good luck to you, Laura. Hello, Diane. Diane, let's see, can methylene blue clear Babesia? No, um, and that's, it's interesting because, you know, methylene blue, one of the things that it was found to do is be effective against malaria. All right, so malaria is a blood parasite and as many of you know, when we're treating Babesia, we basically are using the same things we would use to treat malaria, all right? But methylene blue does not work for Babesia, okay? Thanks for that question. It's a good question. Hello, Teresa. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. A provider submitted my lab to Red Labs for phage testing. The results are negative. I was told I had no Lyme. My cognitive issues may benefit by Aricept or Namenda. I am concerned about this result. You know, um, so I disagree with their conclusion. So everyone, what a phage test is, it's a method of measuring viruses that will be present when a bacteria is there. So um, all bacteria infections that we have in us attract certain viruses. And so those are called bacteriophages. And so in theory, if you have an infection in you, we should be able to measure the bacteriophages that go with them. And in theory, if you have bacteriophages in you, 
against that infection, it means the infection is still in you, okay? Now, the lab that does this, Red Labs, has a lot of information out there where they say they have one of the best tests at finding if it's in you. The truth is they haven't done studies to say how accurate is their test at finding it when it's there, all right? Um, they haven't, so that's called sensitivity. They haven't done testing to tell us how perfect is their test at finding it all the time that it's there. So we don't know. So it is possible the test missed it, all right? I still think the best way to find out if you might have tick-borne infections is the immunoblot method through Igenix. As I mentioned, I talked about that earlier tonight. It is the most sensitive. They've actually got data showing it finds it 95% of the time, okay? The last thing I would tell you is that Lyme in Borrelia is always a clinical diagnosis. And so if you have enough suspicion that it is Borrelia, then you treat for it anyhow, even if testing is negative, okay? Now, you, you have to consider a lot of things in making a diagnosis without a positive test though, okay? So the first thing you look at is, is there a risk you could have gotten it, all right? So are you in an area where there's a lot of Lyme and the ticks carry it, all right? That would be a big risk factor. Did you have a tick bite at one time that you're aware of? Um, do, are you a hunter? Are you a fisherman? It's out among ticks all the time. So, you know, we got to consider things. So, so is there a risk that you might have gotten it? Okay. Number two, um, do you have enough symptoms that look like it? All right. And what I usually recommend people do is take the Horowitz Lyme screening questionnaire to find out, or his MSIDS questionnaire, to see if you have enough uh, risk uh, symptoms to suggest suggest it, okay? And if you score high enough on this questionnaire, then that means you have a lot of the symptoms that say you probably have it, okay? All right, third thing we look at is, are there any physical exam findings? And there aren't any, but there aren't any that's truly say Lyme. Uh, the only one that would really say it is if you have a, a marked bullseye rash at one time. And then number four, do you have supportive testing? Okay, now notice, I didn't say diagnostic testing. A test does not diagnose. It's just another clue that you might have that condition. But let's say you've got negative testing, but you live in New Jersey where 99% of ticks carry Lyme. So you've got a big risk factor, okay? And you've got a lot of symptoms based on the Horowitz questionnaire that says it could be Lyme. And um, th those would be good enough reasons for me to consider doing a trial of antibiotics and seeing um, if, if you respond to that, okay? All right, so anyhow, I hope that gives you some useful information there. Hello, Sandra, thanks, Dr. Marty. Can you please share your opinion on what's best for inflammation, herxes, and anxiety from Lyme Bartonella? Do you recommend Cytoquil by Research Nutritionals or LDN, thanks. All right, so I like using, um, my two key things that I like to use is curcumin by um, Thorn. So that is a product called curcumin phytosome, 500 milligrams. And I will have people take even up to 1,000 milligrams three times a day. In addition, I like people to be on glutathione. And glutathione is a very strong antioxidant, all right? Now, the way that these both work is your um, cytokines, which get elevated in a Herx reaction, are made inside white blood cells. And so consider the white blood cell to be a cytokine factory, okay? The, and, and these factories have to get in order. They have to be directed to make the cytokines, all right? And what directs them to make the cytokines are excess oxidizing agents that get made by the immune system when it's trying to deal with the germ, all right? So the glutathione helps lower the excess oxidation agents and the um, curcumin gets inside the white blood cells and interrupts the production line, okay? That's how they work basically, all right? Now, the product I'd like for the, for the glutathione is by Research Nutritionals, it's called Trifortify. The reason I like that product is it is a liposomal product and which increases its absorption. Glutathione is notoriously difficult to get absorbed, but the formulation that research nutritionals put together, they've got solid data showing it has great absorption and marked increases in levels of glutathione in red blood cells during their studies that show that it does get absorbed out of the GI system, okay? 
So in some ways having a hard time, I'll do 500 milligrams once a day of that, or I might even do uh, 500 milligrams twice a day, which is a teaspoon twice a day, all right? Now, the Cytoquel by Research Nutritionals could be a substitute for the curcumin, all right? The Cytoquel has in it some curcumin, and it's also got another a number of other herbs that also interrupt cytokine production. The truth is I find the best results with the curcumin, just straight curcumin. Some people do like using the cytoquel. And if you were to use that as a substitute for the Mariva 500, then uh, I'm sorry, the uh, curcumin find is owned by, uh, by Thorn, which used to be called Mariva 500. The way I would use the cytoquel is one pill um, three times a day on that. Okay. All right. Now, what low-dose naltrexone does is it's going to be a modulator of your cytokines, but it's not going to give you the immediate relief that um, your curcumin or more immediate relief that the curcumin and the glutathione would. So the low-dose naltrexone as a means of modulating um, cytokine production, so LDN, everyone, is low-dose naltrexone, that's going to take even up to six months to quiet your immune system down. So you're not going to get quick reaction from that. Okay. All right. Let me just do a quick screen share here for you. All right, everyone. So for information about how to manage cytokines, take a look at my Herxheimer and cytokine section here. And here's my guide called... Um, about um, basically it's called control cytokines, a guide to fix Lyme symptoms in the immune system. Okay, all right. And then here I give you a variety of ways of going about lowering those cytokines. Okay, all right. And then um, let's see, there was something else I was gonna show you here. Oh. So in terms of the, um, the curcumin, This is the curcumin phytosome by, um, by Thorn, okay? And then that glutathione product is called Trifortify. And Research Nutritionals makes it in uh, four different, uh, two different flavors. And they actually make it in six different packages now. So they have a big tube, they've got it in individual dose packs. And they recently came out with a smaller tube. The big tube is 48 doses. Their smaller tube is 30 doses. And I, I just need to get that product added here. I actually have it in stock. I just haven't added it so you can buy it here. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question, Sandra. Hello, Jim. Hi, Dr. Ross. I've been to lots of webinars, but I don't think I've ever heard you talk about betaine HCL. I take one cap at meals every day because so many people in the Lyme and natural health world recommend it. Do you think it's necessary if you don't have serious GI issues? So betaine, everyone, is a way of, of, of increasing acid in your stomach. There are a number of people that get gastritis or gastric symptoms that is um, that have the problem because in fact, their gut doesn't make enough acid, okay? Um, and so those people that have continued gastritis, upset feeling in their stomach, and the one thing you can try is to have them take betaine to raise acid levels. And sometimes that will take care of that gastritis, okay? I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it does, all right? So Jim, those are the only situations I'll use betaine. I, don't think there's any other reason that would provide benefit for somebody in Lyme um, other than to do it if you happen to have somebody that is low in acid resulting in their having gastritis, okay, or gastric symptoms. All right. Thanks for the question, Jim. Hello, Justin. Let's see. Hi. Can high-dose methylene blue and or high-dose dapsone be used to kill off these three bacteria and viruses? One, brucella, two, Q fever, and three, EBV. 
And when testing for G6PD, do you run both qualitative and quantitative tests? I asked because there is an enzyme level test. If the enzyme test is with normal range, is it necessary to get the quantitative test to show positive or negative? So you could do the qualitative. It's just going to tell you if you have it, if you have it in you, basically. It, um, actually, I would do the quantitative. Excuse me. I would do the quantitative on that. All right. So everyone, you have to have enough of this enzyme called G6, uh, G6PD. If you have low levels of it and you take methylene blue, methylene blue will hemolyze or break apart your red blood cells. Okay. All right. Regarding whether Dapsone or methylene blue treats brucella Q fever, I don't know. Actually, I haven't had to treat either one of those before, so I don't actually know. Okay. Can um, uh, methylene blue be antiviral? Yes, it can. I don't know that I would build a whole treatment around it because I think there's better antivirals actually. Dapsone would not treat EBV. It's not, it's not antiviral, but methylene blue could. Um, but I, I, in terms of whether I build a treatment on that, I don't think I would. I would prefer using things like monolaurin or olive leaf extract as my um, antiviral agents on that. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question, Justin. Hello, Mirana. Let's see. Dr. Ross, thank you for the answer from the last webinar. I have chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic uh, myopericarditis. I take colchicine now for six months. I am often positive IgM on Epstein bar, mycoplasma pneumonia, Yersinia anarcholica, Leptospira, marginally positive aspergillus. For a year on Western blood, IgM Borrelia. Um, marginally positive. Doctors are not sure what to treat. Are the results false positive? My ANA is 1 to 180. ANA HEP2 is also positive. And all other rheumatology, immunology analysis are negative. I have small proteinuria. My amyloid A is higher than it is normal. I have seen hematologists. He says it is reactive. Amyloid thinking is systemic disease, lupus, but rheumatologists ruled it out. I know I have candida, but I do not know for everything else what is going on. They have told me it is CFS and for marginally positive Borrelia and Western blot, that was for a year. Some doctors here in Serbia where I live say it is false. Oh, boy. Um, Marana, it's 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 going to be hard for me to give you um, a good answer in this kind of a forum because I would need to ask you a lot of questions. I would also want to know: Have you actually uh, been what? Um, have you been tested for Bartonella? What the Bartonella test was? I will tell you the Western blot again will miss uh, the traditional Western blot and how it's done will miss Lyme if it's there about forty five percent of the time. When somebody has a lot of myopericarditis, the two infections I think of are Borrelia and Bartonella can do that as well too. Um, and I, I, I would need to know a lot more questions about your symptoms beyond what is happening with the fatigue and with your heart to know if I would consider this as Bartonella or Borrelia and just treat based on the symptoms. So I, I can't say for sure what to do here. I'm sorry. All right. Um, good luck to you. Hello, Sharon. Can Lyme disease or co-infections affect the vagus nerve that cause heart palpitations in AFib? What would help treat this condition, antibiotics or herbal medicine? So Lyme Borrelia, as well as Babesia, can cause you to have dysfunction of the vagal nerve, either by directly affecting it or triggering a vagal nerve response, okay? Um, and so if it is direct infection, and, and there's no way of knowing for sure, but treating with antibiotics, antimicrobials, targeting those germs often will help, okay? 
Um, and then um, if it is severe enough, sometimes we have to use cardiac medications um, that keep you out of AFib or control the heart rate when you get AFib um, to slow that down while we treat the underlying infections that are triggering that imbalance, okay? All right, um, good luck. Hello, Brenda. Let's see. Can you take methylene blue if you're on a blood thinner Eliquis? I think you can. Um, I would, um, in terms of contraindications for methylene blue, the, the main one is if you happen to be on um, uh, drugs that raise serotonin, like Prozac, uh, the SSRI family, the SNRI family, or MAO inhibitors. You want to be careful. I haven't seen anyone say that you can't take it with Eliquis. The main thing um, you would need to do is, um, I, I, but to be thorough, I would have to look it up. And um, unfortunately, I'm using my camera as my, uh, my video device tonight, or my phone as my video device. And in my phone, <laughs> I have my drug checker. And so I can't look up my drug checker, but I would use, you could Google, um, online to say drug interactions between Eliquis and methylene blue and see what comes up. If there's a lot of warnings around it, then I wouldn't do it. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Brenda. Hello, Don. Let's see. Hi, my husband was diagnosed with ALS in 2021. I'm sorry to hear that. that that's a hard one for sure. We found an LMD and was then treated for toxins mold in Lyme. The fasciculation stopped in his legs a week after he was treated for Lyme in June. He has very slurred speech, no use of his arms and hands and has drop head. He still has use of his legs. He's 55 years old and is doing PT twice a week. Yesterday, I brought your products to fix nerve damage and atrophy. He also did a 13 week stem cell. Let's see. So how long will it take for his nerves to start growing back? Okay. Um, so if you're going to get benefit from using glutathione, using um, ATP 360, uh, possibly using the peptide BPC-157, Usually, I would start seeing improvements, not all the way grown back, but improvements in neurologic function from the neurologic damage somewhere within a two to three month period of time. And if by three months you're just not seeing anything, then it means they're probably not going to work, unfortunately. Okay. Because you're basically repairing the damaged nerves. And the way that the glutathione does it is it's an antioxidant that repairs injury from the inside of the nerves and also injury to the mitochondria, the cell energy factories that get injured too, okay? The ATP 360 is doing phospholipid repair of the nerve membrane and also the mitochondria membrane. And then BPC-157 is a peptide that can actually help repair, uh, that I have seen repair nerve injury as well as muscle and joint injury and can help your immune system work better too, okay? But usually, I'd say by around three months, you should be starting to see something. Not all better, but you should be seeing something. And if you're not, then I'd consider letting those go, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Don. Good luck to your husband. Hello, Joyce. Let's see here. Hi, Dr. Ross. Do you know if a child with pandas and does not get the problem resolved, what happens when they are an adult? My daughter is 35 
And after listening to Lime United on Tuesday, I now realize that she was going through many years ago, must have been pandas. She is now an adult with multiple issues like unresolved anxiety, stress, etc. Her life is a mess and she has conflict in every area of her life. At the time when she was little, all doctors and teachers dismissed her behavior as age-related. Raising her was hell, and she is now suffering the consequences. She had strep every September at the start of school for years, experienced tics, bad behavior issues. Most doctors and teachers dismissed her behavior as age-related. In general, she was a difficult child. I would love your thoughts on this. By the way, we lived in Connecticut. She still does, and our house has gold. Thank you. All right. Let's see. So, um, you know, as, as I was discussing in Lime United and the Ask Marty Ross MD Live, which is what you're referring to, um, when we look at the things that can cause pans and pandas, which uh, pans and pandas, everybody, is basically acute onset uh, psych neuropsych dysfunction. And it can have either an infectious or an autoimmune cause. On the autoimmune side, if you get a strep infection, it triggers an autoimmune reaction that attacks an area of your brain called the basal ganglia, all right? So every one of those repeat strep infections that she was getting would have triggered an autoimmune reaction against the basal ganglia. And if, um, um, uh, so it, she probably is still susceptible to getting that again, okay? Number two, there are multiple other causes besides a group A strep infection that can go give pans or pandas. So any of the tick-borne infections can. And so if they were not treated adequately and they're still there, they're going to be inflaming the basal ganglia as well too, okay? And then finally, mold toxicity can be a cause of, uh, of worsening, when, uh, of triggering pans pandas, because also it will inflame the basal ganglia as well too, that area of your brain called the basal ganglia. So I'm not quite sure that these were unresolved. It just sounds like they weren't resolved, meaning it doesn't sound like anyone ever took time to treat her. And so if she has tick-borne infections and they're treated, she can get better. If she has mold toxicity and that's treated, she can get better. If she is put on a program of antibiotics, possibly to prevent getting strep infections during the high strep periods, she may be able to prevent it that way as well too, okay? All right, so um, yeah, I guess that's how I would answer that, okay? All right. um, good luck to you, Joyce. Actually, everyone, I'm going to do a quick screen share here because I want to show you a resource. For those of you that um, are concerned about pans, pandas, want more information, um, let's see here. <laughs> there is a book out um, by a physician, a medical doctor named O'Hara. And this is it. It's called, uh, her name is Dr. Nan Dr. Nancy O'Hara. She practices in Connecticut. And I looked and she, I was actually at a workshop she, this past weekend that she at, was teaching at. I think she sounds right on. And in this book, Demystifying Pants and Pandas, she reviews all of that, okay? So I think this is a good resource if you're looking for a thorough book about what is really a complicated issue, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Joyce. Hello, M. Let's see. Can taking four point five milligrams naltrexone and TB four frag both together. I understand they both modulate the immune system. I'm also taking BPC-157 and KPV, dealing with POTS, leaky gut. Also, uh, let's see, 
also MCAS. Okay, so let me go back here. All right, so you want to know, can you do naltrexone and TB4 frag together along with BPC-157 and the KPV because you're dealing with POTS and leaky gut, all right? So the BPC-157 could heal the leaky gut. The KPV is a way of stabilizing your mast cells, so that could help with the mast cell activation syndrome. The um, And also the... The PBC-157 KPV can also help uh, balance an immune system that's attacking you as well, too. The TB4 frag, I think, is stronger at balancing the immune system, and I would have no problem adding that to a BPC-157 KPV regimen. And in addition, the naltrexone regulates the immune system, but in an entirely different way, by helping to elevate a, a type of cell called a Treg cell that governs how much Th1 and Th2 inflammation you get. In other words, yeah, I see no reason you couldn't use all those together. I, I, I think it's an expensive way of going, but I see no reason you couldn't do it. If you wanted to tailor it back, you might just do the naltrexone, the BPC-157, and the KPV, and forget about the TB4 frag. I'm not sure, given that you're using a naltrexone and a 157 and the KPV, that you necessarily need to be using that TB4 frag, okay? All right, um, good luck to you. All right, so for all of you that are wondering what the heck did we just talk about there? Um, so in my, um, my Lyme information site here, I've got a whole article about peptides where I discuss what each of these individual peptides can do, like the BPC-157, the TB4 frag, KPV, et cetera. Okay, so take a look at this. This gives you information to figure out what we were just talking about there, okay? And then in terms of low-dose naltrexone, what it can do and how to use it, um, take a look in my immune system chapter And this is my article on low-dose naltrexone where I talk about how it can work too, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Em. Hello, Lynn. Let's see. I had COVID mid-January. Excuse me, everyone. Just a minute. I had COVID mid-January with just a few symptoms of fatigue, fever, brain fog, and dizzy spells. Took Paxlovid and fever resolved and testing turkey negative in two days. The following week, the fever and brain fog came back, and after a few weeks, I thought it was finally gone, but it seems to have come back. I recovered from chronic Lyme Bartonella babesi about 12 years ago, and someone suggested the fatigue and brain fog might be related to re-triggering Lyme. I have no idea what to think. I wonder if this is a version of long COVID, and regardless of what supplements or protocols you recommend. I have done two 50 gram vitamin C IVs, which seem to help a little for a short time, and then it comes back. And of course, I have been doing vitamin D, quercetin, zinc, B complex, vitamin A ongoing. Do you think taking something for mitochondria energy makes sense, or what can I do? How can I know test for whether this is Lyme related or long COVID? Thank you for any thoughts and for all you do. All right. So it's a, it's a it's a tough question. So. If we look at long COVID, by um, around one month after people have COVID, about 30% of people still experience symptoms. By six months, that drops down to about 10%, yeah, 10, uh, six to 10%. And then by a year, one to 2% of people still have symptoms of COVID, okay? So, 
it could be just a matter of time of waiting to see if your body will turn around. It could be, okay, all right. But then there are a number of things we know that COVID does. And the people that tend to get into having long COVID are the ones that have more of the mild COVID, believe it or not, okay? So there are things that we know that long COVID or that COVID does. One of the big things it does is it disrupts your gut microbiome. It gets, it knocks out healthy bacteria that regulate your immune system that make um, serotonin that helps your brain work well. And so you've got disruption of the microbiome as one big problem, okay? The second big thing that happens when you have COVID is the virus directly um, uh, damages your mitochondria, your cell energy factories. And so sometimes working, repairing the mitochondria can make a difference for that too, okay? The other thing that can happen when you get COVID is um, because these ACE receptors that the germ uses are found through multiple organs in the body, you actually can get organ injury as well. And one big organ that gets injured is the lining of your, red, uh, your blood cell system uh, or your blood vessels, and that's called the endothelial glycocalyx. And if it gets injured, you then have um, more easy blood clotting and micro clotting happening, which impairs your ability to get well as well too, okay? Now, I've been looking at all this because I'm, I'm going to be putting together an article within the next week or two about a probable protocol that can help people with long COVID, all right? But the thing that you may want to look at doing, here's, here's what it comes down to, is number one, I would try to get this turned on inflammation under control that happens, all right? And to do that, I would suggest using curcumin, 500 milligrams three times a day, and in addition, to get that inflammation down, I would use the uh, liposomal glutathione, that Trifortify product, one teaspoon once a day, okay? So number one, get inflammation down, okay? All right. Number two, repair your mitochondria. And the way to do that is with the um, ATP360 product, which rebuilds the phospholipids, and it has a number of micronutrients in it that help your mitochondria work better. And I would do three pills one time a day. And the glutathione already said to be on to help get inflammation under control helps repair your mitochondria as well too, okay? Number three, you need to fix this these damaged blood vessels so that you stop, you can start getting rid of microclotting that's happening and improve blood flow, okay? And the product that does that is, um, is an extract that comes from green seaweed, believe it or not. And that product is called um, Arterosol. Um, I'll show you here in a minute. It's A-R-T-E-R-O-S-I-L, I believe. I'll show it to you. Arterosol um, by Calroy. And there's good data that shows that it will actually repair your damaged red blood vessels and, and be able to stop all that microclotting. The way you use it is in the first 30 days, you want to take two capsules two times a day. And then for the next two months, you would want to do one capsule two times a day, okay? In addition, you want to rebuild your healthy gut microbiome. And a way to do that is to use a spore-forming probiotic called Megaspore. And you would take that um, at one capsule a day. Um, and then after, the, then after that, you would then increase to two uh, capsules a day, okay? And then you want to be on a prebiotic that helps your gut work better too. It helps us uh, turn around the the the, um, the dysbiosis in your gut. And that would be mega pre is uh, the probiotic I would use. And I would do, uh, I would take that one time a day, okay? In addition, because we're starting to see a lot of this is due to disruption of serotonin production in the gut and tryptophan absorption. One thing that is helpful is to actually supplement tryptophan to build um, serotonin levels in your brain. And um, the way to do that is uh, I like using something called 5-hydroxytryptophan, also called 5-HTP. And I was do 100, I would work, up, I would start at 50 milligrams three times a day, and then after a week or so go up to 
um, um, 100 milligrams three times a day. Okay. All right. So those are kind of the essential things that I do in terms of trying to help people that have long COVID. All right. Now there is a um, protocol that actually was put together by a group called um, Ovation Lab that is very similar to what I just described to you. And in that protocol, 50% of people get better, get well 100%, well over three months, and the rest of the people have improvements but don't get all the way well, all right? So um, again, I, I, I will be writing this down eventually uh, where you can read it, but you can uh, basically explain what's probably gonna be in the article when I write it up here, all right? The other thing in terms of how do you determine is this active Lyme? So it is possible that Lyme uh, or that COVID can re-trigger uh, Bartonella or Borrelia if they are still in you. But I gotta tell you, if you've gone 12 years symptom-free, the chances are that when you treated, you might have wiped those infections out, okay? So usually I would go down the treating the long COVID pathway first. There is not really decent testing we can do to see if you've reactivated your infections. The only way to really do that might be to do what's called an Ellispot test. Um, so an Ellispot measures do you have white blood cell activity against infections and they're called T cell activity. And the problem, and so if your, your T cells that fight infections only live for two months. So if your T cell activity test, also known as an Ellispot, comes back positive for these infections, it means that, yeah, they're probably active in you, okay? The difficulty is though, is that um, the, the methods that we use, the Ellispot that is done by InfectoLab here in this country, only detects one strain of Borrelia, not all eight strains. And their test for, um, Ellispot test for Bartonella only detects one strain, not the 15 strains we think can do this. And for Babesia, they only detect one strain, not the 15 to 20 strains that might do it, okay? So it's not that useful, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Lynn. It's a very difficult problem. Let me, let me show you that um, Arterosol product that I was telling you about. All right, so the arterosol Okay, so this is the arterosol HP that can do a good job of repairing um, the damaged vascular system as well, too. Okay, all right. And then um, the one other thing that you may want to... Um, that, that is part of this protocol where they got 50% of people well, is they recommend doing a plant-based diet, uh, very much a plant-forward diet. Plants are gonna help get your gut working better the quickest, and they tend to be low inflammatory, okay? The other thing is, is not to isolate, but still have your social connections if you can. That is very helpful as well too, okay? All right, good luck to you. Oh, how do you like that? We're already at 7.30 here. All right, everyone, that's it. I've um, got a couple Basinjis, as you know, my two dogs that hang out with me here, but they're going to need Basinji time here, and I need some Basinji time. Um, it's been good to be with you here tonight, everyone. Um, so I already talked about Lime United earlier, so I won't I won't do a complete sales pitch for you on that. But I, I again, if you think you're getting great benefit here, I encourage you all to look at joining Lime United. Um, I'm trying to build an active community there. And I think that there's uh, the more the more people, the better to a point, right? And so right now we still have space. I'd like to bring on at least about 30 more people. And at that point, I might just close it down for a while and try to keep the membership around 100. 
So it's a very active, very friendly, very knowledgeable group. As I showed you earlier, there's various ways you can interact with me there, but also you're going to have great interactions and learning from the other members as well, too. So I encourage you to take a look at that group as well, too. Uh, keep your eye out on your email tomorrow, and you'll get an email from me somewhere around 9, 9.30 a.m. Central Standard Time um, announcing that the uh, recording is ready to be seen. It will include a summary as well, too, okay? And in that uh, email, you can sign up for next week's webinar. And please share my emails with everyone you think might get benefit. Um, if you're getting benefit, people you know with Lyme or people that have family members with Lyme, they're going to get benefit here as well, too. All right? All right. Good night, everyone.